So I had the pleasure to lead the uh, planning and execution activities of the uh, Lifeline teams, which included eight engineers from the US and four to eight uh, locals from Turkey. You can read our names here on the slides and see our, be our beautiful places, uh, faces in the, in the slides. Uh, we had a very diverse range of expertise, including post rocket experience from some of the most important earthquakes in the last 10 years. And uh, I want to start my presentation giving a shout out to the local academics and professionals that supported our, our team. Um, there was a lot of what I call tea, tea drinking, and if you see the middle photo in the slide, kind of summarizes it. If it wasn't for the local, I don't think we would have accomplished so much. Uh, so thank you again for, uh, for the local support. So we visited 150 sites plus. In the span of seven days, we had about 10 days to organize our work, so very short span. Um, we had three teams in the field, and we covered more than 3,000 miles, so that's roughly the, the distance between San Francisco and Boston, just to give you an idea. We visited dams, coal plants, substation, tunnels, bridges, treatment plants, ports, so very diverse portfolio. and. Um, due to the uh, lack of time today, we're just going to focus on a subset of this facility, which are high highlighted in bold text in this slide. On the right, you see, uh, it's kind of like a, a draft map that we use to prioritize our site visit. So we visited most of these sites, but not all of those. Um, and there is many more sites that we visited. The sites pins are overlaid on the 7.8 and 7.5 um, magnitude earthquake PGA contour map. So I just want to give you an understanding of the size of the area that we visited. So a lot of data that we were processing and you know it's going to take some time to process and publish a report but nonetheless the preliminary insights from our post-earthquake post investigations that the uh, lifeline system performed relatively well if you consider the uh, unique earthquake sequence so, for example, the uh, hydroelectric dams were operable when, the, when they got power back from the grid. The grid itself performed relatively well. They got, um, you know, there was little damage from the transmission system, so they were up and running in a few days. Ports and airports had no major disruption, very few school collapses, and one of the two units of the um, coal plant that we visited in the bay was up and running a month after the earthquake. With that said, I want to emphasize that there are exceptions and some of the lifelines got hit harder than others. And the next few slides are going to provide some examples of damage and key lessons learned. Two plants that were still offline at the time of our visit. So we're talking about six weeks after the main shock. And the story with the first one is um, they had the main shock and the operators left the facility to care for the family after the main shock. So they left the boiler system essentially on what I call autopilot. And they had, uh, this is remote, this is north to the uh, 7.5 epicenter. And they, had, they experienced a few days of below freezing temperatures. So the water in the system froze and now they're coming back and experiencing those, all these um, leaks in the, in the system. The other plant is just near, nearby, and um, they told us they are still completing visual inspection and testing. And one of the reasons they claim uh, it was taking so long for them is a shortage of skilled workers. So this is kind of up north, and they're finding you know, it's difficult for them to find people to fix stuff. There were a lot of uh, distribution substation structural damage and a lot of collapses affecting uh, lifeline, lifeline equipment. And I think, uh, in my mind, uh, I think one of the, the main research topics that is possibly coming out of this earthquake is looking into what I call seismic interaction. So looking at the performance of uh, equipment supporting lifelines that got hit by something falling on top of it. So structures falling on top of structures, structures falling on top of equipment, equipment falling on top of equipment, Rock fall and you know falling on top of equipment. So very diverse 
interactions. So this is an example that you see on this slide. is a distribution substation from Adana. So we're talking about, you know, far away from the fault. And uh, the building up on the right collapsed and hit this distribution substation. And uh, mechanical equipment within this substation survived the uh, high frequency impact load. So this was a success story. Other sample stories of uh, other sites closer to the fault. Um, we're talking about, again, infills and uh, precast members falling on top of mechanical equipment. Uh, again, many electrical and mechanical equipment got hit, and some survived, some didn't. Something that we should look into. This is an interesting story. So we visited this substation. It's literally 1,000 feet from the fault. And um, at this particular location, the fault moved 10 feet laterally. So it was purely um, horizontal, not much movement vertically. And the, whole, the only uh, significant seismic effect that this substation was in an anchor transformer that toppled and spilled oil but didn't, didn't catch fire. So again, Overall, I think the lifeline equipment performed relatively well, with some exception, unless it was an anchor or fully anchored, or it got struck by um, other stuff. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Ezra. Thanks, Ricardo. Well, I'll continue the uh, trend of talking about electrical assets, but move on to linear utility assets. So transmission and distribution lines. I'm really glad that Oz brought up that there were conflicting stories about how these assets performed because that was our experience as well in advance and I, I think we'll see some examples of, of poor performance often from interactions with, with other elements. So on the left hand side for example this is in, uh, in Takia. Uh, you can see a, a utility pole that has been hit by a building collapsing on top of it. This was very common uh, in Antakya, also structures hitting conductors that then pull down the poles around them. In some instances, equipment's falling off, but it mainly was things falling on the poles and on the conductors. On the right-hand side, we can see a rock fall. And this one that came all the way from the top of the hill, that massive rock that's about twice as tall as me, we stand next to it. And uh, the wood pole that's there is a replacement pole on the right-hand side. The road was blocked by this rock fall, so it took helicopters to fly in to actually replace uh, uh, the assets before they cleared the road so they could get electricity back up and running in that service territory. Um, I, I'm thankful again to Oz for showing the steel transmission structures that appeared to be basically fine, uh, very close to where there was a lot of, of, uh, of liquefaction. And I think that echoes our observations as well, where when a, a transmission tower is sitting in a field hit by relatively low inertial forces, uh, generally performs pretty well, uh, but there are instances where they uh, are subjected to some geotechnical hazards. So in this case, there was a landslide that picked up two of the legs of the tower, but two of the other legs of the tower were not picked up by the landslide, and that led to the collapse of this tower. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, in the background another very similar tower about 300, 400 meters away that is perfectly fine. So only the one that was in the unfortunate position to be picked up in the landslide uh, collapsed here. I want to talk about bridges. We saw about 90 bridge structures, more than 90 bridge structures, uh, over a very large region. Many of them uh, were, were near fault, and I'm including in this count viaducts. So bridges, as we call them in the U.S., that don't go over water, the viaduct there. And in some of these locations, there were peak ground velocities of greater than 200 centimeters per second, which is something I don't think we had, had seen before, so quite intense. On the right-hand side, we'll zoom in, and we can see around the Antakya area, there are quite a lot of bridges over the river that are very, very close to the fault. So there were some very common bridge conditions, and a particular type of, of bridge structure that was very common uh, was concrete uh, precast girders spanning between different types of abutments and different types of, of, of piers. Um, but one thing that many of them had in common, especially the older ones, uh, was that they didn't have diaphragms either in the middle or at the edge of, uh, end, ends of the girders. So those girders could effectively move independent of each other um, and were only really braced by, by the deck and uh, by the abutment or the pier that they were sitting on, or the vent they were sitting on. And so that was problematic. Uh, and we tended to see more damage in those locations. On the right-hand side, 
We see another example uh, that was very common to these types of bridges where there are shear keys that have nearly uh, failed or nearly come off and quite a bit of transverse mo uh, movement uh, of the girders. And I think this is largely because one, the intensity of shaking, and two, there's not a lot of concrete there holding a very large bridge structure from moving uh, in the transverse direction. The locations that had much more robust uh, 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 shear keys uh, performed quite a bit better. Some other uh, common bridge conditions where when there was a lot of longitudinal shaking where the bearing pads walked out from underneath the girders and this tended to happen more when there were thicker bearing pads that could undergo more shear deformation, the thinner ones did a little bit better. And then an interesting observation we had in many of these bridges is that they were up and running despite significant damage in many locations right away because asphalt was just put over to uh, over, over the road to bridge, say, a one-foot gap so you could drive over it. And this is crucial when you have a river going through a major city with, say, 400,000 people. You need to be able to cross that river to perform emergency operations, so it's quite understandable. Uh, there were some less common bridge conditions. So one, when there was quite a bit of vertical movement, if there was not sufficient uh, area on the piers for the girders to move, then they could fall off the edge of the piers and you could see collapses. And on the right-hand side, we see an example where this didn't quite happen. There was lateral spreading on one side of the bridge that undermined some of the piers and the girders look like they're almost on, on their way off the pier, but they didn't, uh, they didn't quite make it, fortunately. And uh, we did not drive over this bridge, but we saw many other people do that, despite about eight or nine percent lean. Uh, moving past bridges uh, to roads, um, a lot of the road damage was close to, to rivers in, in some cities where there had been embankment failures that were deforming the roads. Uh, and something that we would see is when a road was either damaged or was blocked by debris falling in, into the road from some building, there would be makeshift roads that were put in place uh, around that, like we see on the right-hand side, that, that red fence is where a building had collapsed and the road on the left, that's a new road that was just created in the last month or so. And uh, my last slide is, is something that I didn't think about as a lifeline beforehand, but um, in driving around uh, Turkey, I think I would now, and these are granary silos, so it's a very agricultural region. Uh, in Turkey where the earthquake occurred and they need to feed the animals with a bunch of corn. So there are many silos that house that corn and uh, if, if those don't perform well then it will be very tough to uh, maintain feeding those animals and maintain uh, a lot of the economy in the long term. Um, so there were quite a few silos that collapsed for various reasons from a combination of issues with seismic bracing to these silos are all attached by equipment at the top. So if one fails they have equipment attached to something else and is pulling it down and is also failing. And for comparison, on the right-hand side, we see a properly seismically uh, braced silo that is not in Turkey. Brad is now going to talk about water infrastructure. We can save the applause for the end, huh? Um, uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit of background on water and wastewater uh, infrastructure. We looked at a lot of uh, different things, um, treatment plants, um, for both water and wastewater, towers, pump stations, um, transmission infrastructure. We talked to a number of different water utilities to understand some of the challenges and things they went through. Um, Kosky Water, for instance, had 5,000 pipe repairs that they did by the time we got there, which is 120 repairs a day, which puts some of our uh, local municipalities, uh, not sure they would be able to handle some of those things. Um, Hatsu uh, was heavily damaged in the Ankia area um, and uh, we're, are continuing to not be able to provide uh, water. They're pumping three times the normal amount, uh, but they can, or can't access a lot of the pipe breaks because they're under uh, damaged buildings and things like that. But I'm gonna focus a little bit on Gazi water, uh, where we have a couple of examples of uh, some of the damage and things like that that we uh, saw. So I'm gonna do it a little bit like a story. So where do you get your water from? This particular uh, province in Turkey gets water from three sources. Um, one is the Katalakia uh, transmission line, uh, which is dam source. It's about 45 kilometers from uh, Antep. Uh, there's two lines there. There's a 1.4 uh, meter pre-stressed concrete pipe, which was damaged in 10 different locations uh, and took a long time to be repaired. Uh, and large sections had to be removed, which we've shown a picture up here. And they had a newer 1.8 meter diameter pipe that uh, basically uh, was installed parallel to that, and that was one of the few places that this uh, area was able to bring water into uh, shortly after the earthquake. A second source uh, that was constructed in 2016, there's a lot of influx of people in the area from, uh, for various reasons, 
Um, and so they've been building a lot in infrastructure. We talked about that a little bit earlier, um, is the dues bag water source. Uh, and so this is uh, um, a, a water source that is uh, supplied by a 21 uh, kilometer line uh, power distribution line, which was damaged, and they had to take snowmobiles out to try to fix that just to get it back in operational. Then they had water quality issues, and at the time we were there, they still did not have good enough water uh, due to um, quality concerns from upriver uh, to be able to supply water. So the damages I'm going to show you this, they did a they tried really hard to deal with this transmission pipeline, which was 83 kilometers long, 2.6 meter diameter uh, steel line uh, that had a number of different damages uh, throughout its length, which I'll give you a couple of examples of. Um, and, but even at the time we were there, they were still not getting water from this uh, particular source. Um, one of the regions that we looked at closely with this large transmission pipeline is a, is a tunnel uh, that passed through over a length of 3.5 kilometers. Uh, it's about a five meter bore uh, uh, tunnel so that you can get in there and you can potentially do repairs if those are necessary. The tunnel itself uh, unfortunately crossed a uh, fault, uh, maybe somewhere between four and five meters of offset. And so there are four to five locations of significant damage within this concrete structure. Uh, where we had significant spalding of, of uh, concrete, uh, majoritively horizontal displacements, but some vertical displacements, uh, buckling of rebar on the sides and things like that. Uh, and so this uh, water utility is, is trying to figure out what to do at this time. But I would say that the tunnel performed relatively well and that did collapse and, and was able to handle the, the displacements that were applied. So the pipeline that was inside of this tunnel uh, was also designed relatively well in that uh, it had expansion joints um, spaced every um, about 100 meters uh, for thermal contractions, but they also were very helpful in accommodating some of this earthquake movement. Um, so these expansion joints um, the, uh, expanded about uh, 14 of them. As it went through, uh, the pipe was able to displace axially in different areas. Uh, which is uh, is shown in the first picture here, which I don't think you can see my cursor, so that's not very helpful. Um, and uh, some of the areas where it's restrained to the tunnel, those um, were, uh, were were damaged, of course. Um, and the way they fixed this thing as rapidly as they possibly could is they went into the middle of the tunnel, uh, they cut it, they jacked it open, and installed a 30 centimeter uh, sleeve. Uh, between the two pieces, we were able to get things realigned and be able to continue to move water through this particular location. We're not quite done with this particular pipeline's um, challenges. Uh, at another location, there is a 4.5 meter fault rupture uh, that this pipeline cross. Uh, you'll see the yellow line there is a gas transmission line that runs over top of the pipe. The blue line is the approximate original uh, orientation of the pipe. They had to cross the gas line, which was there previous to the installation of this, uh, at an uh, angle between 90 and 75 degrees. Um, and so they, they put a jive in the pipe, and of course that's almost exactly where the fault uh, ruptured. So really interesting um, things to take from this situation. The fault rupture was generally in line with the gas transmission uh, pipeline, and so there wasn't much damage that they've been able to determine from that of yet, uh, but there was significant damage to the water line, and those um, pieces have been removed and replaced now. Uh, and there's some pictures of, of some of the um, some of the some of the damage to those pieces. So that was two out of three of their prime water sources. There was a third uh, prime water source, which is the Mizmilli water source. Uh, this is a field with 30 wells, about 120 feet deep, uh, with four different levels of pumping stations, each with four pumps. Um, and so, in the picture on the left-hand side is before the uh, before the earthquake and after is 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 what was happening at the time. Again. The infrastructure, the, the, the lifelines that they installed, the pumps continued to work despite the earthquake. Uh, they, they were down for a little while, they were going to get power back, and they were going to get them back up and running and continue to supply water. The building, however, needed to come down. Uh, it was a safety concern. And so um, uh, a testament to some of the engineers in Turkey, they built these steel, and, and the laborers, they built these steel uh, buildings around the pumps to protect them and deconstructed the concrete facility around the outside and are working on building that back up and rehousing these pumps in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the challenges that one of the water utilities, we talked to a number of them, uh, a number of different uh, infrastructure systems, the wastewater treatment plants were 
Uh, similarly uh, affected in, in pretty significant ways. We visited over eight of them, um, various damage levels. A lot of these have been constructed more recently, so they had the same construction um, methods and practices, and so they were distributed uh, in a way that you could gather some things about um, sort of how they performed and some of the things that we can learn. Uh, many of these systems are similar to the systems we use here in the US. Um, so partition walls at the center, uh, experienced a lot of damage while um, also some of the, the internal membrane uh, filtration was did not do as well. Um, so we have a lot of work that we're continuing to do to take in all this information uh, and, and disseminate it and get it out to everyone. Uh, this is that overview of the 150 sites. Looking forward, we're um, continuing to work on that. We've got a report that we're targeting the end of uh, April for and a web series sometime maybe in May that we put together for that and hopefully some contributions to Earthquake Spectre in the future. Um, I'd like to, we would like to thank specifically uh, the rest of our team uh, and particularly the Turkish speakers because this would not have been possible without, without our in-country interpreters both for the language and for the technical knowledge, uh, so important. Uh, and the organizations that sponsored uh, us and uh, ERI Atlantic Earthquakes.